There's a lot to cover, but today what we're going to be looking at really are sort of four big key moments in your life. So your life in Czechoslovakia before the war, uh, after the Hungarian occupation, life in the camp, and then finally sort of liberation and after the war. So we're going to just jump right in. Marty, tell me, tell us about your life in Czechoslovakia, your parents, Jacob and Golda, and your eight siblings. What was your family life like? Well, uh, my family life actually was very good. We, uh, like she mentioned, we lived in Czechoslovakia. Now, sometimes, uh, because you live in the United States, you have, uh, it's hard to explain. It was Czechoslovakia when I was a kid in the 1930s, and uh, prior to World War I, it was Hung the Austro-Hungarian Empire, so it was something different. And under the Czechs, we had, uh, by the way, we were one of the few countries that had democracy. And the reason, even at a young age, even of under 10 years old, I remember we were very proud. And the reason uh, we're very proud is because uh, next door to us was Poland, and they had a dictator at the time. Hungary had a very archaic system. They had like a, they didn't have a king anymore, but they had a, a king representative. In other words, they, they didn't have what I would call democracy. However, uh, they, uh, you know, in both of those countries, uh, people were able to live fairly normal, but they, nevertheless, they didn't have what we had, okay? And uh, I, like uh, Sarah mentioned, I came from a family of uh, nine children. I was number seven, so I had older brothers and sisters. And uh, because I had older brothers and sisters, it made a big difference in my life because, first of all, we have a big family and, uh, uh, and we, we just liked each other. Let's put it this way. We didn't have any problems with each other. Now, my older brothers were working very hard. And by the way, my father was in, uh, and had, we had a far, uh, land, so we were farming. We grew our own food and so on. And uh, so my brothers, as soon as they were old enough, they all worked we did our own plowing, our own field, you know, the fields and all that. And you needed sons for that. But my, uh, but what I got out of it is because they were older and they were very, uh, they looked forward like to a good, good life and uh, hopeful. And we were all, uh, like frankly, uh, even at, at that age, uh, I figured, well, as, and I had this thing worked up in my own head that the more educated people get, the more civilized they get, and the more, the more of that people would just be nicer, okay? I, unfortunately, I was wrong. Mm -hmm. But uh, nevertheless, uh, because of uh, them, I did have a very good outlook. But like, we, you know, to put it simply, everything was going good. Now, in 1938, when Hitler started making noise, and we kept on hearing already what was happening in Germany, and uh, they uh, were arresting people for nothing and all kind of stuff like this, and uh, as especially the Jewish population, and they singled out, by the way, it wasn't just Jews, actually, they, anybody that was not what they call Aryan race, okay? And they were very, very, uh, how can I put it, uh, they had even a slogan, they said, Deutschland über alles. And I was like, the Germans were above everybody, okay? And they believed that. And by the way, Hungarians did exactly the same thing. So they were very racist, to put it simply. They were very, uh, just, they were, that's the way it was their culture. And uh, under the Czechs, we were not used to that because we were citizens, period. It doesn't matter who you were. And, uh, so we kept on hearing of all the things that were happening. They were arresting people. People were running away. The one had the means or had the, was smart enough to leave. Many of them figured, well, it's going to blow over. They'll have a new government and so on in Germany. And so many of them did not. It was their home. You have to remember, the Jewish, uh, Jews lived in Germany for about five, 600 years prior to that. Okay, so you give, it gives you an idea. They were not newcomers. And uh, the same thing happened in a lot of other countries, like in France and so on. And, but as time went on, 1939, Hitler decided to uh, go to war. And one of the first countries, he was looking at the Czech, uh, the Czech Republic is right next to it. So he, uh, and, and the Czechs, they had a, a, 
uh, there a city there, uh, actually it was a spa city, a beautiful city. I lived there for a while after the war. And they had a lot of Germans living there, quite a number. And they were all very successful. They had businesses, they had beautiful houses, I'm talking about villas, uh, and, and they really were living, they were on the high end of, the, of, the, of, of wealth. And when Hitler came, to, when, I, when he started making a move, he said, I want Sudetenland because they're German and it should belong to me. And the, German, uh, the Germans in Sudetenland said, yeah, we want to belong to Germany. Just like this. Here they were good citizens. They, were, they had freedom. Now they wanted Hitler. So Hitler came and he took Sudetenland. That was the first step. Then after that, he, uh, what do you call it? He kept an eye of the rest of, the, of, of what do you call it, the country and so on. So he decided, well, if this was so easy, I'll go for the rest of it. So he took the rest of the country. Now what happened, Czechoslovakia was the Czech part, which is Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Carpathian Rus, what they call it. Okay, uh, and uh, one of the reasons, if you notice, I said, do we use the word Rus? The population in our area were mostly Russian speaking, okay? And, uh, was it a big town or a small town? It was a small town. It was uh, actually, I wouldn't even call it a village. You know, it was a good sized town, a village actually. It was not even a, remotely a, a city or anything like that. Uh, and uh, like I said, we lived there and uh, everything was good. We produced our own food. My father had a business. And uh, so, like I say, my older brothers were uh, doing all that work in a business and uh, what do you call it, uh, in the fields. And as soon as we were big enough, we all contributed. Now, the girls uh, did their thing too. They did whatever they could. They, uh, you have to remember, we, we lived in a society. We still had uh, those blacktop stoves. We had to put fire fed with uh, wood, I should say. And uh, ovens and brick ovens, uh, everything had to be fed with wood. We had no electricity, by the way. And we didn't miss it. This is what we were used to it. And uh, we lived like this, and everything was fine. And uh, Anyway, uh, and so once, how old are you? You're about like nine, ten. Yeah, but actually, when when yeah when, when we're occupied, I was ten years old. Exactly. Okay. Uh, yeah, exactly ten years old. Uh, so this was all good up till then. Then when I had to make the move, uh, what a lot of people don't uh, realize, Hitler didn't do everything alone. He had allies. Okay, they call them the Axis powers, actually. And so what they did, what uh, what he did is. Uh, He gave, uh, Hungary was one of them. I'll just speak, there were others, but uh, like Hungary, uh, oh my God, there were a, a, a flu, Romania and a, few, a number of others. Each one of them that joined, now they were able, to, because he got the country, so he was able, to, he gave them back, he gave them the, our area, to, he gave to Hungary, okay? So they were occupied by Hungary. Now, they, and. My father actually was old enough, he served in World War I on the Hungarian Empire, okay, Austro-Hungarian Empire. So he said, well, the Hungarians are not so bad. We could, live, we could get along, we could live with them. So fine, we were, uh, you know, a little complacent, I guess. And uh, the problem was that Hungary, because they were a part of the Axis powers, they adopted the same ideas what Hitler did in Germany. He, they, they took away all the civil rights. They took away, in other words, they arrested people at random. They did whatever they wanted to. But that's what police states do. And, and uh, so when they came in, obviously we didn't like them. Uh, here, because under checks we lived, you know, our life was normal. And uh, one thing they did, once they, were, they occupied the area, they, uh, confiscated all the Jewish businesses, okay? They took away the license. You had to have a license to open any business. And consequently, all those people didn't have any income after that. And so it created a problem. And uh, this was only in the beginning, right in the beginning. And as time went on, they kept on following all the, the ideas that Germany established in Germany. They were doing it now there. And, uh, this was, this was the beginning, and I remember, even as, like I say, I was 10 years old, 
and all of a sudden, our whole life changed. Now, they, were, they closed our schools right away, but we went to check schools. And uh, there was no other school to go to, but there was a Russian school. Like I said, the population was mostly Russian. And uh, what happened, when we, uh, by that time, I went actually to fifth grade. I was up to fourth grade, I went to check schools. And we loved school, everything was nice. The teachers were, by the way, very similar to the United States. Uh, nice, bright rooms, and uh, uh, it was just relaxed. We, 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 we all loved school, okay? Were you a good student? Did you like Yeah, I was actually a good student. student? Yeah. You know, at, that yeah. time, at that time, I was. <laughs> that changed. <That's> a... <laughs> so then they closed our school, and there was uh, no other school to go to. Uh, they, uh, but there was a Russian school. Now, why Russian? Like I said, the population was Russian, and they wanted their own schools, so the Czech was, was democracy, so they had their own schools, like you could have a Catholic school or whatever. So they had their own school. The problem was, we went to the school. Now, even though I spoke Russian, because, like I say, our neighbors were Russian. When I learned Russian, I don't know, because as I grew up, I just knew Russian. <laughs> Most likely because our neighbors were Russian. <laughs> So I don't, I don't remember ever having a, 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 how can I put a learning time. Just, I didn't, just spoke it. So they, uh, the, so they trans uh, we had to transfer to this Russian school. And here our whole life changed. First of all, everything was miserable. Everything was like, like just pictures of sunny day. Then all of a sudden everything is drizzly, cloudy. It looks miserable. That's just the way you felt. The, the school was a complete opposite of, of our school. They had a teacher, I remember, he was a short guy, and he was a mean, nasty man. And he, the minute we came in, now mind you, I spoke Russian, but I didn't know the alphabet. It's an incorrect alphabet. I didn't know anything about that, uh, about the grammar. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I knew how to speak it. I, oh, that was no problem. We came into the class, and we had to, uh, uh, other kids in the same class, and they didn't even give us a chance to learn the alphabet. They expected us to carry the whole workload as the others without knowing the alphabet. How can you write something if you don't know that? You don't know even how to write it, <laughs> you know, because they have different, different letters too. Uh, you know, the symbols, everything is different. And uh, anyway, this is the beginning. Consequently, uh, over here, by the way, they believed in corporal punishment. So what happened, if a kid didn't know something, the teacher would take and by the way, our rooms were always cold because we lived in a cold climate. And the heating, they had a stove usually in a corner, like a big, uh, like uh, from a, like a tile type stove. But it, if it gave off some heat, you didn't get it in the rest of the room. The room was big. So we were cold. So when you sat down to write something, you couldn't hold a pencil in your hand because your fingers were so cold. This was our introduction to this. And you can imagine as a kid, you don't like it. You know, then he would go to work, and if the kids didn't know something or something, he would take a stick and just get the, he had to put out an ear. When your fingers are cold, it's terrible. If somebody hits you, it's bam. And this was normal. Oh my God. And you know, all of a sudden, you're like in a different world, which it was. And this was our introduction to this, to this particular school. But somehow or another, like I say, I used to love school before, and it was very good. Here, Take my word for it, I was not. <laughs> you couldn't, even if you wanted to. But uh, anyway, I went, you know, went through the school, and uh, eventually I learned uh, how to read and write and so on. But uh, it, it took a while. But that was, for a young kid, 10 years old, that's a big, big deal. And you said a lot of things were being restricted with businesses. How did your oh, family, yeah. okay. you know, how did you have food? How did you survive? Yeah, okay, now they took away, like I mentioned, everybody's businesses. Somehow my father's business license, they, they overlooked. Don't ask me why. They just did. And so we were able to stay in business. However, <laughs> what happened, because there was war, and they needed all the, he was in the meat business, so he, you, in order for you to get a, a cattle for slaughtering, okay, you had to have a, 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 a the, the state would give you a permission how many, how many cattle you could get. Well, guess what? They left the license, but they wouldn't give us any allotment. 
okay? Because we were Jews, okay? Very simple. And uh, so we, we had the license, we were able to stay open, but no, there was no way to get the product. So guess what? We had to do things, everything during the night, okay? Now mind you, we lived in, in this, this town forever. Uh, we had neighbors, we got along, no problem. But because of the, 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 the during wartime, you don't trust anybody, okay? You really don't trust even your neighbors, okay? Even if you, you think they're nice neighbors, you still don't trust them. Now they hated the Hungarians as much as we did because the Hungarians looked at them as inferior, okay? They didn't like us because we're Jews, but they didn't like them because they're inferior. It's just Germans look the same thing at everybody else. Of any Slavic people, by the way, any, I should have mentioned that, any Slavic people, the, the, the Aryan race or the Germans or the Hungarians were so, uh, uh, what do you call it, they decided that they were superior and the Slavic people are dumb, or they're stupid, they're inferior, very simple. And so this was, this was just the way it was. So what happened, we still had to make a living, so we did everything during the night. We had to do, believe it or not, we didn't have electricity, so we, believe it or not, my, uh, we had to do it at one, two o'clock in the morning, that nobody should even notice that we are doing anything. And we didn't have uh, electricity, and that's important. I, I, we had candles, so I would handle, uh, have two candles, and my brother did all this work by two candles, okay? and. We didn't have any modern equipment. Everything was done the hard way, you know, the old-fashioned way. And this is the way what we were getting by. In the meantime, we had the fields, so we always had enough food. One thing we did, we always, uh, my father was very good at that, at managing. We were able to grow all kind of crops and everything. Like I say, we worked very hard, but we did it. And if sometime if uh, my sister was, uh, uh, my older sisters, if they were home, they would help too, whatever they could. And they would help my mother because there was a lot of cooking. You have to remember, we didn't have any gas. You turn it on, it burns. Everything had to be done manually and you had to bring them the water from the outside. All these things were very difficult. But we were no, uh, to us it was okay because we were used to it. But this, this went on uh, in the beginning. Then later on, uh, my older sister, uh, she went to college, no less, in the city. That was unusual. Guess how many people in, from town went to college? She was the only one. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. No, there were two, two boys that were also, one of them was actually our neighbor. Uh, he was a nice young man. He was about my, uh, my sister's age. And uh, one was, uh, he went on a scholarship. No, wait a minute, there were two. They went on a scholarship. And there was, so there were three of, the, three of them, actually. And but she was the only girl. She was the only girl, right. And so, because she was going, living in the city, and she, oh, so on, so when she came home, she was very sophisticated. She didn't have any clothes that you make at home, you know, like uh, uh, with a sewing machine, like my mother used to sew. A lot of people sewed. Uh, the girls were wear like house dresses type all the time. She came home, she was already, she had Paris fashion. She was already, you know. And that was, and I remember looking up to her. She was more sophisticated. And because of her, I got this urge to get educated, okay? She had an impact on me. So anyway, life went on. But then, we, uh, there was about 1942 or so, they, uh, the Hungarians went to work and they, they picked up a, a number of families from different places. Like from our town, there were a couple of families, someplace else, a couple of families. And they picked them up uh, without notice. They had to give them a, like a, a couple hours to pack. And by the way, most of the people were poor, okay? They didn't have any luggage. So you know what they used? They used pillowcases and uh, sheets, and they put in some like bundles, like you see something, uh, some, uh, like a peasant wearing or something, and put that stuff together. And they, uh, they put them on uh, trains, like the boxcars, and they shipped them out to the Ukraine. Now, by that time, Russia owned the Ukraine. I mean, the Germans were in Ukraine. They already occupied Ukraine by that time. And they, uh, they shipped them out to Ukraine. Now, what happened is this. 
this too, you have to remember, our winters were really but very cold, like it was a lot of snow. But the farther east you went, like Poland or Ukraine, was much more so. And they would take them to the Ukraine and drop them off in a forest someplace, and where the snow was really literally this, this high, you know, very, very deep, and they would let them loose. And what they were doing, but by that time already, I don't know if you ever heard the word Einsatzgruppen. The Einsatzgruppen were people, were soldiers, that after when the German army went into Ukraine or Russia, you have to remember, Poland, Ukraine, and Russia are big countries, each one of them. Now Ukraine especially is very large. And they also have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, forests and uh, you know, a lot of mountains and so on. We live, we live too, we, are, we, are, we are live in the mountains area. And they would take them, drop them off there, and they would wander. There are no food, very poor clothing for the weather and so on. What's more, the natives there were very inhospitable. Okay, they would stick their dogs at them and all so on. And they were going from place to place. Now, the reason I'm telling you this something, you're not going to read this in the history book, unfortunately, because nobody writes about it, is we kept on hearing this, and when the Germans went in, they were merciless. They went to work like, a, like in Poland, they were brutal, and all the, because they were Slavs, you know, they were, they were uh, you know, you, you could, they're not people. That's the way they looked at you. And one of the stories, we, and we used to hear all this because in terms of, uh, and don't ask me how we got the, st the stories, they all came through the grapevine. There was no newspaper or radio or anything like this, that people escaped and they returned. Or, uh, also, which I might add, uh, what I should have mentioned, right in the beginning, they went to work and they and inducted all the mili uh, men military age, like from about 20 to 50, into the Hungarian, not army, but they, they, they uh, all the Jewish men, I should say, uh, because they had a mobilization, and the other men went into the army to fight, the, but the, the Jewish men were not good for the army because politically were undesirable, right? So uh, they put them into a labor, uh, labor battalions, okay? And the labor battalions uh, were under army supervision, but they were not army. They were civilian clothes and so on. But what do they use them for? I'll tell you, one of the main things they use them for, cutting down the forests from the Carpathian, from our area, all the way to Russia. Now, mind you, to Poland, and I say Poland and Ukraine are large countries. And the reason I'm telling you this, I'll, get, I'll tie it together later. <laughs> uh, so th they were using them for that. However, my, my brothers uh, were sent to the, on the Russian front. Now, if you want to go to hell, that's where you went, to Russian front. They would use them for picking minefields and burying the dead. So thousands and thousands of them were stationed there. And they witnessed all the things that were going on. By this time, we already heard of the massacres, like the Einsatzgruppen were going for what they did when the troops were so successful, they ran into that part, uh, like, uh, they took Poland in three weeks, okay, let me give you an example. But the other part, like Ukraine, was a vast country. They, uh, they just went in there, and the Einstein's group followed them. They picked up all the people, whether it's a village with six families, or a, a city like in Lithuania of 20,000 people could, be, could have had been there. They took them to a field and just killed them. With machine guns, they just round them and killed them. And so in some cases, they had to dig their own mass graves, okay? Now, all this was going on, I used to hear this. Again, I, uh, through the grapevine, and plus some people returned. So a lot of the witnesses I'm talking about were stationed there, like my brothers and my, I had cousins and so on. And I'll get back to, to as they were wandering around in, uh, in uh, the UK, they, uh, the Hungarians, by the way, the Hungarians, you have to remember, they were allies, so they were fighting alongside the Germans, but the Hungarians had their own section. And when they came to a bridge, on a bridge, like during wartime, you have sentries on the, all the four corners of the bridge. And when these people came around, 
The Hungarian troops were bored because there were, uh, there were sta uh, uh, sentries there. And uh, they would take, and the stories we got were still home, like I say. They would take, uh, I remember a story, the, uh, there's a family, and the woman had a child in her arms. And the soldier would rip out, uh, rip the child from the mother and bash his head against a rock. And only then would they throw her into the river. And all the people that they were there, they threw them into the river. The river was running with bodies all day, every single day. It was called the Nesta River. Marty, I want to ask about what happened. You said your brothers were on the Eastern Front, yeah. right? Yeah. And then by 44, things have sort of really deteriorated. Like you said, the, yeah. the Hungarians are there. Right. Let's talk about going to the Munkash ghetto. Yeah. Okay. So did yeah. you go on a boxcar or a train right. car to yeah. that as well? Or? Before I get to that, I just want to finish some. As far as my family goes, like I say, there was nine of us, and we were, uh, my two older brothers were gone. So anyway, uh, the bottom line is that my mother, my two younger sisters uh, died immediately in Auschwitz, okay, as soon as we got there. But uh, my, uh, uh, oh, my older sister, uh, two older sisters were together and I, uh, one of them died in Belzenbergen, uh, but one of them did survive. So it was like, uh, yeah, uh, so, and my two brothers survived. However, I had one brother, he was in, in the Russian front the longest, and he was uh, doing all this stuff with the, with the minefields and all, he picked the minefields and stuff, he was there a long time. And then finally, many of them, by the way, uh, were able, because they were on the Russian front, they were able to either escape or were captured by the Russians. Okay, let me clarify that. And once they got on the Russian side, the Russian gave them a choice to join the Czechoslovakian Legion. By the way, by that time, they established the Czechoslovakian Legion in Russia. And so many of them joined, many of them, a lot of them, joined the Czechoslovakian Legion. They came back as soldiers, including my brother-in-law. But my brother wasn't so lucky. When he got to the Russian side, guess what? They accused him of being a German spy. And once they accused you, they was gone. That's the way the Russians were. So they put him into a POW camp with the, Russian, with the German prisoners. He spent an extra two years after the war, an extra two years in a Russian prison in a coal mine. So can you imagine? We didn't even know he was alive anymore. Anyway, eventually about, uh, uh, about two, two years, two, uh, two and a half years, we found out he was alive. Okay, eventually he, he reconnected with my brother in the Czech Republic and they both eventually came out to the United States. I just wanted to clarify that, I got it out of the way. That's no. good, that's amazing that he yeah. survived that yeah. Russian POW camp. And uh, anyway. So I, but tell us, yeah, again, back, back to you and, and what happened to you. So you okay. were sent to the ghetto. Okay, now in our case. So other people from the town were being sent to the, clear the minefield, or to the- No, 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 the no, no not, not other people, just the people that were in, inducted into that service. Gotcha, and, okay, yeah. yeah. Not, not other people, we were left at home. You were left at home? Yeah. Now, uh, what happened is that after that, they, uh, oh, the Germans asked for the, for, uh, for the, uh, the Jewish population earlier in, in the war. And the Hungarian says, no, they're our citizens, you can't have them. And that was it. You don't have to, uh, uh, people think that the Germans were so, they would punish him or something, no. The same thing, by the way, Italy, Mussolini was a fascist. He did that. The Italian Jews didn't go to Auschwitz, only after, he, uh, he, they tried to assassinate him, and the German troops came in. Then when the, some of them went to, po uh, to Auschwitz, okay? Just to give, clarify that. And, uh, but later on, they asked again. This time the Hungarians said, you want them? You can have them. Just like this, they went to work, uh, uh, and they rounded up over 400,000 people. 400, I'm talking about families, women, children. In two months, mind you, two months, think of the United States is a big country, think of the logistics, 
okay? They only had one track going from an our area from us to Auschwitz, okay? They, had, there was, you, they needed material for the troops. They tied it up with us. In two months, they shipped out over 400,000 people. That's how eager they were. Well, they announced, they're gonna pick you up. They came, the police came, they arrested us, not the Germans. They turned us over and needless to say, the ghetto got, uh, I'm not gonna get there for the sake of time, but we were there just a few weeks, like about five weeks to be exact. And uh, one day they pulled up a, a box cars, a train of box cars. They put us on a train. Now we knew already, we heard of the Einsatzgruppen killings, we heard that, and by the way, more people were killed the, by the Einsatzgruppen than in Auschwitz itself, okay? And the reason is, they had more time to do it. And they were killing people on a daily basis in mass graves. Some 30, 40,000 that they clip, okay, you can imagine. Some place maybe 300, but you know, there, there are a lot of, but the Ukraine is loaded with these, these uh, mass graves. They uh, put us on a train. Now in our boxcar, we had 125 people in a boxcar with the bundles and all this, lots of children, lots of old people like grandparents and so on. And in Europe, a grandparent was very old. Okay, I'm a grandparent, but I don't feel that old. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I am old. But you see, in Europe, it was different. But the, the thing was, they uh, put us in boxcars, locked the door, and they left out the door a little bit open. As we're going, we, 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 the, we knew we were in for big trouble because by now we heard of the massacres and all the, the killings and all that. So that's where you thought you were going, to a yeah. site for a, not, a, not a place like Auschwitz. Uh, right. Yeah. No, no. What did you say? You thought maybe you were going to one of these oh, sites yeah. that they were just going to no, drop we, you No, we didn't know where we were going, actually. We knew we were in big trouble. Let's put this We knew that. And uh, they locked us in on the thing. And by the way, you know, I, I, we went for several days. Uh, the train was going along for about several days. And uh, I remember, we, we, I don't even know what we ate. We, I don't think, we, uh, one thing I remember, we didn't have any water because we came to, a, oh, we came to Poland and we recognized where we were, we were in Poland. So we were going, new. then we realized we were in big trouble. Going east was not the best. We, we, are, we knew right from the start, but each time was, uh, you hope against hope that it will not happen. And uh, while we were on the train, again, we tried to decide, uh, our rumors start, well, what's gonna happen to us? Now, by now, we knew about killings, we knew about all the real things, but nobody knew about Auschwitz. We didn't know anything about that. But we came to Poland, and I remember the train the, had to stop in certain cities on the station, and one of the reasons was in those days they used the locomotives and they had to get water for the locomotive because they used coal. And uh, anyway, so they would stop, the train would stop on the station and we saw the sign on a, 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 like a Polish, Polish cities. And we cried for water. Nobody would give us a drink of water. We were locked in there. And uh, food, I don't remember, we probably didn't have any, but food you could do without, but water is something else. And, uh, oh, we speculated that the capable people will work, and because of that, our families are put in a camp, they're not gonna be treated in a country club, they'll be, but they'll survive because it, uh, of our labor. They'll feed them. Well, this was because we were civilized people, and that's how we were thinking. Obviously, that was a pipe dream. Anyway, we came to Auschwitz, and Auschwitz was, uh, we happened to come during the night, and the minute we came into Auschwitz to the camp itself, they opened the doors, and the minute they opened the doors, there were people uh, running around like, like madmen with the striped uniforms and uh, threatening you with big sticks like broomsticks and, uh, what do you call it, shouting all kinds of orders in German. Now, we understood a little bit, but we didn't understand the orders. But anyway, we, had, we got off the train at the boxcar. And by the way, the boxcars, to most of us, don't seem that high. But when you try to jump, even for a young man, it's, it's a big, big jump down. And we were old, like my mother and my sisters. And you know, they, they were young sisters. And there were a lot of, it was difficult to get down. 
And those people we found out were capos, and they were other prisoners, but that's what they had to do. They were, you know, they, if they didn't do that, they were in trouble, okay? So they had to act thief, but we didn't know that, of course. But because it was nighttime, they had sort of our perimeter there that we got off the train. And you have to remember, there were uh, a, a lot of people because it was a long train. I, I remember that. Was our, our train, I remember, was 120 boxcars. I remember counting them, and I'll tell you why. The, on a curve, you could see the end of the train. And as a kid, you know, you do this. You count the boxcars. And so they were, they were long trains. And as soon as we disembarked, they had the floodlights surrounding us. But more than that, they had soldiers with uh, uh, rifles but the trigger, their finger on the trigger, literally. And this was our welcome to Auschwitz. And I always, and all of a sudden, you know, if you thought you were afraid before, forget it. I mean, that's, this was fear, believe me. And, and the only thing I could describe it, if somebody would talk about hell, believe me, hell could, was not as frightening as this situation was. On top of it, not only did you have the soldiers with a, with a finger on the trigger, but they had dogs, real killer dogs. They were tra trained to kill. They were actually held back on a leash, and they were like growling. They were ready to, if they got a hold of a person, they would tear you apart in two minutes. And this is the kind of situation it was. And you have to remember, we all were, were innocent people. We never knew violence or anything like this. It just didn't happen. And, uh, to be in this situation, believe me, you, you, the fear of God gets into you. We separated men from the women immediately, and we had to go through a line. And the end of the, and in the front of the line, I should say, there was an officer with shiny boots, very sharp. One thing about them, it was like a Hollywood movie star, you know, like very sharp. And all he would do is go like this or like that. If you went to the right, you went to work, if you went to the left, you went to your death. Now we knew, like I said, we all had to figure out that they'll take care of our families. Yeah. We found out very soon that it didn't work that way. But so we went through, through the line. Now, before I got off the train, because I thought about working, I was not a big kid. I was like 14, almost 15. And, but I was not big. And I uh, put an extra couple of jackets on. So when I went through the line, I, my father and my brother were in front of me. They were tall. And what do you call it? And I went through and I passed. Well, I didn't know how lucky I was that I passed. I found out later, almost all my friends from the school did not, okay? There was actually f f four, yeah, four others. Yeah, there was five of us. But I was the only one born in 29 from the whole, all the kids in school that came back. Okay, from the boys. The others uh, were actually technically a year older, but we were about the same size, so I'm not gonna make a big deal out of it. And the only reason I think I, I made it is because I had the extra jackets, because I was not big. But this is something that happens, whether it's, you know, whatever, but this is what happened. And as soon as we, we uh, what do you call it, we passed through, we were picked for work, they took us to a shower a real shower. And they, they shaved all the men, especially the grown men, all their body hair even was, you know, top to bottom. And they gave us the striped clothes. I was lucky, I got wooden shoes, but they had a covering, like a plastic covering over them. And I didn't realize how lucky I was. Some of them didn't even get that. They had those Dutch shoes, you know, carved off with, from wood, like you see in a movie uh, or, or a picture. And uh, some of them didn't have that. They had these uh, clogs uh, that you used at the beach, like with a little burlap over the piece of thing. Some of them had that. This is in, in climate that was always cold. Anyway, they took us to a shower. We came out of the shower. Next, by that time, it was dawn. <coughs> they marched us up to the barrack, uh, to a barrack not far from there. And we came to the barrack, and all of a sudden, we saw uh, like I say, it wasn't any daylight. We saw these big chimneys around, like a, almost like a circle, of five or six uh, chimneys. We found out they're called crematoriums. We never heard of a crematorium. 
And that's what they were doing with the bodies, okay? So we found that out very quickly. But then, they wouldn't let us into our barrack. We had to stand outside, like I said, it was cold. And the funniest thing is, it was uh, the spring of the year, but it was miserable, uh, like, it wasn't even raining, but it was drizzle and very gray. And, you know, with hindsight, here and later on, I remember not hearing a bird in the air in the spring of the year. And uh, as we were standing, we had to stand outside. It was so cold, we were shivering because those clothes were very thin. And uh, that 15, 20 of us would get together in a, hu uh, in a huddle and just to keep our body warm, you know, because our teeth were rattling. But while we saw the chimney, we found out where the chimneys were. And of course, you could smell the smoke, uh, uh, literally like flesh burning. And then, not far, a few hundred yards away, there was this big ditch, like almost the length of a football field, and with pine trees. But under the pine trees, there was a fire, like the whole ditch was a flame, with flames going up to the height of the pine trees. And again, we asked one of the coppers what that is. <laughs> he looks at us, he says, those are the transport that came in last night, they're all up in flames. The crematoriums were so over, overloaded, they couldn't handle the volume, so they used this, these pits to burn the rest of the bodies. Those are your families. Just when I, that was the first, the first morning in, in Auschwitz. And believe me, if nothing sobers you up, that does. <coughs> Once you see that, you, you just, I remember, you know, I was, like I say, very young, and I remember even getting tears. We just, I don't know what happened. I, I just remember that we were all, nobody spoke about it. We never spoke about it to each other, nothing. Never, we never t mentioned it to each other. And anyway, uh, it was Auschwitz only, uh, I could go more about that, but only uh, like about eight or 10 days. And they put us on a train again. And this time, believe it or not, only 50 in a train. But, we had two guards inside. Why they needed two guards? We were locked in there anyway. But we had to sit like this cross-legged in one position in rows. And we were not allowed to whisper. We were not allowed to move. We were not allowed to do anything. The funny thing is, with hindsight, with years later, I remember uh, thinking, I don't remember getting any food or water. I don't remember any of that. Isn't that funny? Otherwise, if, I did, if we did, I would have remembered. But I don't remember. Obviously, we didn't. But we were rolling, this time we are going westward. And the reason we knew where we were going is because we came to uh, Austria and the train stopped on, on, a, on a bridge. And we saw uh, Vienna not far off. You could immediately, even I could tell from pictures probably that it was Vienna with the, with the architecture and so on. And, uh, but we stopped there for a while. Then later on, we didn't know what was gonna happen to us. Uh, but then uh, the train, started again, and we came to a desti our destination. Now, we came to our destination, and uh, we disembarked, and we found out that, uh, oh, alongside this huge mountain, a huge, huge mountain. It turned out this mountain was a stone quarry. Okay, that's why it was a big, big mountain. And the camp was built on top of the stone quarry, so on top of the mountain. And they, mar we, they marched us up down the road to the top of the, the camp. Now, we came to the camp, now, like I said, it was a stone quarry. Everything there in Auschwitz, I mean, Mauthausen was built from a stone quarry. The, the towers, the, uh, the gate, they had uh, not like uh, some of the camps, but this one had towers that were looked like from an English, from an old movie from 15, 1600 in England, like, you know. Like a medieval like castle. Like a medieval castle, right. And those, those, plus they have a big, big gate, tall, high gate, and and the stone, all the walls were built out of stone from the quarry. And they had, we found out later, Mauthausen was a huge, huge camp. It was so big, they also had a lot of subcamps. I knew about 40. Lately, the museum does research, they found as many as 80 or 90, okay? So I, I knew about 40 at one time. But the point is, they marched up to the camp, they, we came into the camp, and again, here was the opposite from Auschwitz, we were on top of the mountain, it was hot. And I mean hot. 
the sun it was on top of the mountain, so it gets hotter, and the sun was so bright that I remember uh, we had to stand outside all day. At night, we had to go in the barracks. And guess how we slept in the barracks? Something like oh, you would only see in a movie. They would have, the barracks were very, uh, just ordinary, like an army barrack. We would go in, uh, we would stand outside in the sun all day. By the way, it was, the sun was so strong that I got an eye infection the first few days. And by the way, throughout the whole time I was in camp, I had an eye infection that every morning I got up, I had to take 10 minutes just to get my, the stuff uh, out of my eyes so I could open my eyes. I couldn't even open my eyes. And it lasted, it took about two, three years after the war for me to, to get rid of it. That's how, one effect that I, I had on it. <coughs> but anyway, uh, we, <coughs> we uh, what do you call, walked into the barracks, uh, I'll just give you this, I normally don't mention it because I don't, uh, for the sake of time. They lined up mattresses on both sides of the barrack and they, we had to, when they blew a whistle, you had to run in, I mean run, over the steps to get into the thing, line up along, uh, in rows like this, in goose fashion, on each side of the mattress, and somebody would blow a whistle, you had to fall down. One head to go bend this way, the feet bend that way, and, one, and uh, the opposite. So we're laying like sardines, but one, uh, you're, you're uh, you, were, uh, you had somebody else's feet in your face, and I had somebody else, somebody else had mine. It's just the way it was, just like sardines. And this is the way it was. And here's the, the irony of the whole thing. In the morning, again, they blew a whistle, we had to be out, and if you were too slow, somebody would smack you with a stick at the a, at a, at a door. We had to stand again outside all day. And this is the way it was. And when you go through this, this process, you say to yourself, what kind of world, what kind of people, who are these people that they could do this? They t even thought of doing it that way. But that is the way it was. And I didn't stay in Mauthausen too long. Now Mauthausen, was, like I said, was very big. They had a lot of sub camps. I was sent to a camp called Melk. The, other, <laughs> the irony of it is, again, Melk is a beautiful, beautiful town. With I'm telling you, just a, a picture postcard town. And I'll tell you why, the Danube runs right through it. And on one side, we were, the reason I, I remember seeing it very, every day we went to work. And by the way, the work we did, most of us worked on tunnel. We were building tunnels under, uh, under this huge mountain. And uh, when passed through town, you could see the, Across the Danube, there was a, a mountain with, you know, with trees and stuff, but there were monasteries, uh, all castles, all set. It's like, I'm telling you, a picture postcard. And today, by the way, if somebody takes a, on a trip on the Danube, you, they pass that. And this is what you saw, and you said to yourself, and, and we are here, marching like this. Anyway, we, we, our job was to dig a tunnel, uh, tunnels, seven tunnels simultaneously. And that's why the, the, the camp was there. And uh, we, uh, we marched to, uh, you know, we had a, uh, they built a special trestle on a, in a field, but it was high above the ground because to meet the train tracks. And uh, we, had, we went to that train, we marched every day to and from work, uh, by train, we went to work by train. And uh, Again, we had to stand out there, and when it was cold and it was windy, that wind goes right through you, believe it or not, and uh, just to stand up there, but you have to stand at attention, okay? So, and, Marty, yeah. I don't want to cut you off, but we're yeah. running out of time, yeah. and I want, I know there's a story that you want to yeah. tell about liberation, okay, and, and uh, what happened there, so I want you to tell us, so you were in Madhouse and you were building the tunnels, yeah. And then what happened? Yeah. What ha talk us through well, the anyway, So uh, the Russians are advancing. Kind of briefly, yeah. Uh, and by the way, my father was uh, in the same camp. However, I hardly saw him. He was on the other side, one side of the camp, and I was on the other. I mean, he died there. Okay, so then I, I was, uh, you were alone anyway. No, no matter how many people say, do you have friends? 
we had friends, but they were always gone. You didn't have anybody that you were really friends, friends with. You were not long enough together. Anyway, they shipped us. Oh, yeah, the Russians were hungry. We heard that they were hungry, and the Americans were coming in from the west. And we had, uh, so they shipped us back to Mauthausen. Uh, anyway, uh, I can't give you too much detail of the other stuff, but uh, we shipped, they shipped us back to Mauthausen. And uh, the, as soon as we came to Mauthausen, uh, the first thing they did, they separated, by the way, um, milk, they were all mixed population. I'm talking about every country had representation just about in Europe. There were Ukrainians, Russians, Poles, Greeks, Italians, uh, you name it. They were represented. But as soon as we came to Mauthausen, guess what? And by the way, we didn't have any markings. We were Jewish or anything like this. We just had like a marking if you're political or you're there for a, a, a crime like murder, rape, robbery, whatever. You know, there were, there were people like this. Actually, most of them were German. So, yeah, they were Germans too. I forgot to mention. Yeah, so anyway, we uh, came back to Mauthausen, and the first thing they did as soon as we came to Mauthausen for the first time, we were singled out as Jews. They, they took uh, our, us out of the camp, and they took us to the side of the mountain. And the side of the mountain, there was nothing wrong with it, but it was outside the camp itself. And there were uh, all uh, the, the area was very inhospitable. It had torn bushes. There was barely a piece of grass that you could lay down in, or or whatever. And by that time, by the way, the food, by the way, the food was always a problem. We were always starved. Not hungry, starved. But by now, believe me, we got nothing. Uh, I'm, again, because of time, I can't give you details, but uh, we got a, a 150 calories a day. Believe me, it was a lot. And uh, they figured, oh, okay, now they're going to kill us. Why would they separate us? Why would they do that? Here they could just take open the machine guns and just mow us down. That's it. So we were resigned. This is it. We never, never expected them to leave us alive, uh, let us out alive. Let's put it this way. Because then we could tell the world what happened. Uh, at, at least that's what we figured. But, but so we were resigned to it. But guess what? We were there uh, for a certain amount of time. I remember exactly where, or how long. It couldn't have been too long. But by that time, people were really falling down. They were just plain, you know, like we, were, we looked more like the walking dead than, than human beings. But guess what? One day they come out, we are going on a march. Later, uh, later they coined a death march, a force march, whatever. Instead of killing us, now we were surprised they didn't kill us, okay? Why they march us someplace else? So we started marching. And most of the time, we marched on country roads. And we marched from Mauthausen to Linz in that area. And uh, you have to remember, again, the food was a big thing because hunger is the very thing that possesses you. You can't think of anything else. As we were marching, there were many people who were just tripped. And they, they tripped themselves, and they fell down or something. And they couldn't get up. The guard would just pick up his rifle and just shoot him right there on the spot, just like that. I'll give you one little answer. I always like to mention, as we were walking, there's one time there was a fellow right near me. He saw a potato on the ground, and he jumped for the potato. Then another fellow from the other side saw the same potato and jumped for it as well. Guess what? They started fighting over the potato. OK? Guess what? Again, the guard was like as close as she is to be. Picked up his rifle, shot one man right on the face, just like that. Now, even seeing what I did and being used to violence like this, but when you see a man do this, I don't care if he was German or what, he was an ordinary man. But if he's not SS, he was just an ordinary army, okay, regular army. And they were not supposed to be that bad, okay? And I could never understand what the heck who his parents were, how was he raised. I don't care how much of a Nazi he was. And when you see this, anyway, we came to our destination. This time was a new camp was, uh, uh, that we came to. It was called Gunskirchen, which is uh, outside Linz, actually. And there, we came, there were thousands of people there. But guess what? Only five barracks. 
He had to stand again outside all day, at night, and to the bear. God forbid you should stick your head out. You would be shot. He would go in, 5,000 men in a barrack for the night. Guess how we spend the night? Standing up like sardines, upright sardines, okay? And this is the way you spend your night. But I was younger, and I was able to crouch down a little bit, and so I, I was able to, to spend the night crouched. You know, that was a little easier. And this, is, this was our experience in Gunzkirchen. But more than that, by here, by now, most people were just in very, very bad shape. But guess what happened to me when I got to Gunzkirchen? Mind you, there were about 14 or 15,000 people there. And as soon as I came to Gunzkirchen, I ran into a cousin of mine that was in Hungary in the Hungarian labor battalion. And the Hungarians, they were such bastards, as you can imagine, they took those people, instead of leaving them there, the Russians were there already, and just go, go home, run home. They didn't. They evacuated them, brought them into Austria, turned them over to the Nazis, and they put them in this camp. <laughs> And I ran into my cousin. Now, oddly enough, in Melk, I was with his brother. When, his, when, I, when we were uh, shipped out, his brother uh, went to a different camp, and I went to this camp. And I, his brother was there. Now, he was about 22 or so years old. He had about three, two other buddies. And how in the world I found him, I don't know. Out of so many people, and actually I hooked up, that was a big lift for me. But this time, by the way, I was. A basket case almost, although some people were worse, obviously. And uh, but I teamed up with them, and uh, at least I had it gave me a certain lift, okay. And because they were in pretty good shape compared to us, I mean they they, they had it bad, but nothing nothing to what we had. And uh, then we went to work, and we uh, we heard one day that the guards have left, and. But of course, we didn't believe it. So many people did walk out. And uh, we figured out that it's going to be a trap. When we go out the gate, they'll have machine guns waiting and the mall's down. This was their MO, right? So we decided to stay, spend an extra night starving in this place, but I did not, we did not leave till the following day. The following day, we finally realized, OK, it's true. We didn't see any Americans, by the way. So we walked out to the highway. And we saw American troops. There were the tanks and the jeeps, and my God. Oh, plus it was a beautiful sunny day. <laughs> beautiful. It was like rebirth. But we time were so hungry. So we went into a field, and uh, we found a abandoned train uh, with uh, uh, army train, and it had a bunch of canned goods in there. Cro problem is, we didn't have anything to open it with. So we realized we got some cans, we figured well, it was food, so we had to have it. It was like liverwurst, spam, and that kind of stuff. And by the way, that would have killed us if we ate it. Yeah, if you had nothing. To, right, yeah. exactly. But in the meantime, uh, we, came, we saw this truck in a ditch in a field. And we saw this, this truck in a ditch, and we went to investigating uh, what, what was in it. We figured we'd find something. Guess what? We found a tub of lard on the front seat. Just plain lard. And I said, the, the guys that I was with, they were like 20, 22 years old. And one of the guys, they were still in good shape. He went to, he took his fist, went right through the glass, <laughs> to the window, the door window. All the glass fell into the lard. <laughs> okay, I, I mean this is not this is not this is a real story. So we went and we took the, the lard on the grass. We scooped it out with our palm of our hand, cleaned it up. We saved the lard. We're about to walk away, and one of the guys says, "Let's look at what's in the back of the truck." We go to the back of the truck. We climb up there, and we so far, we struck gold. For what, we, what did we find? We find leather hides all refined already for use. And we got really excited. Why? We knew for love or money, not that we had either one, but we needed shoes. Now, Europe, believe it or not, shoemakers still knew how to make shoes from scratch. Like when I was a kid, we had boots made by the shoemaker, okay? 
And so we were all excited. So I couldn't carry too much. I remember I was lucky I walked. But each one of us rolled up a few of the heights and we, we were very, very excited about it. But in the meantime, we saw this farmhouse not far away. We came to, the, to finally we reached the farmhouse. Now, one thing I will stress to you, I'll, I'll mention, I had such hatred. To me, every German was a Nazi and every Nazi was a German. And if somebody said, here's a pistol, shoot somebody, I remember feeling like I had such rage. Such hate, such rage. I could have done it. But here's what happened after. We came to the house and we knocked on the door. We didn't barge in. And a lady comes to the door and she opens the door just a little bit and she asks one of the guys what, what we want. And, and I, all I saw is her face because they were taller than I was, and they were in front of me. And so that's all I saw of her. And one of the guys asked her to give us some eggs, some flour, and some water. She went back into the kitchen, brought it to the door, gave it to us. We never entered her door. You know, after I started speaking, it took four or five years before I remembered this. Now I always like to include it in my closing. We, we took the ingredients. We didn't go into her kitchen to cook the darn stuff, to mix it up and cook it. Why? I don't know. But you know what it is? One of the guys says that there was a barn in the backyard, and in front of the barn there was one of those iron kettles. They used to heat up water for the cows. Uh, they would throw some, uh, like in a, sometimes stale bread or something, for, to give it more milk or whatever. We made a fire, we put some water in there, and one of the guys mixed up the ingredients, he made dumplings. That was the easiest to, to make. That's why we used the lard. <laughs> and the, the other ingredients. And uh, again, sometimes you get a fifth sense, and you know what to do without knowing. I had about three or four of them. And when you're hungry, I must emphasize that, if somebody gave you a five pound loaf of bread, you, you don't want to leave it. You want to eat the whole thing. You want to leave it, for, leave it for later. You were just so, you got like an animal. You just want to eat the whole thing. And, but somehow something told me after four or so, I stopped. And the reason I pointed out, there were thousands of people when they, when the Americans started giving them food or the British, but even on the first, from our camp alone, five or 6,000 of them died the first week or two, okay? Before they realized what took place. Anyway, one of the guys had an uncle, he attached himself with us too, he was older. He was around 50, that was considered old. Not too many 50 year olds. And uh, he ate too much and he died a day or two later, okay? So it just shows you. Anyway, but here's the clincher. After we finished eating, and we remember, we're very content. Oh my God, the first time you ate like something like a human being. Besides, we were, we were really very hungry. But uh, when we finished, one of the guys says, you know something, each one of us should take some of the hides and go give it to the lady. And what bothered me after I, I re I'm telling you, I spoke four or five years before I remember this, but I remember that it bothered me. What the heck is all wrong with me? How come I didn't object? I mean, give me a break. I, I mean, she was German. I hated her. And we never did anything to her. He says, let's take some, of, each one give some hides and we'll take it to the woman. We contributed, each one gave some of the hides, went to her, knocked on the door, and gave it to her and said, thank you. What really is, when I remember that, I got so mad at myself, how come I didn't object? I mean, they didn't go through what we did, don't get me wrong, they didn't have it good, but nothing compared to what I did. So, till this day, I'll never figure it out. But what really got me after, I was really mad at myself, then I thought of myself for a couple of things I, I, that I learned to live with. That the way we were raised, the Judaic values and the way our families raised us, number one. Number two, that in spite we were dehumanized to a point we were, didn't feel like humans, we still acted like human beings. 
Oh, stop right here. Thank you, Marty. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, so unfortunately we've gone over so we don't have time for questions. I do want you all just to stay seated for just a moment. In just a second our photographer Joel is going to come up and we're going to do a photo with you all in the audience. So with Marty facing this way. So just to hang tight for just one more second. Um, first person runs every Wednesday and Thursday until the middle of August. You can find out more information on the website. Um, and before I turn back to Marty to have the last word, unless you want that to be your last word, which is... Um, mm. uh, <laughs> Pretty powerful. Um, Marty's going to be out in the uh, lobby of the theater out just after this to sign books. You can ask him your questions then. You can shake his hand, take a photo. Yeah, if anyone wants to talk to me outside, outside I'm glad. Schmooze, kibitz, we'll be outside. Um, and so and we'll, uh, we will be exiting through that door and then meet everyone up there. So, um, Marty, you do have the last word if you want it. Uh, and when you're done, then Joel will come up and we'll, we'll take well, the photo. Well, uh, my last word would be very simple. Don't be a bystander. When someone's house is on fire, what do you do? You try to save everybody, right? What do you call the fire department? Uh, the same thing, if something happens to somebody, like a neighbor, or somebody uh, is, does something like, it could be uh, the government or somebody, uh, don't just let it go and, and say, well, it has nothing to do with me, which many people did. It always has something to do with you. Because I think it's a, uh, we are human beings and we should care. And I always tell, I speak to school kids a lot or, or college, whatever. I always tell them one thing. If somebody doesn't like you because of your religion or your, where you came from or whatever, chances are he doesn't like somebody else if he is next to somebody else. People like this have a disease, and they think that there's probably something wrong with somebody else, but I'm perfect, okay? And that's another thing. In other words, uh, but most of all, that you have to have the values of a human being rather than, than because somebody else is mean, that you have to be mean too. And if you teach your children like this, I think we are in good shape. And by the way, I will brag about the children. I've spoken to schools and just about Many, many places, okay? Whether it's in North Carolina or Utah or in between. Every single time I went, I always come back feeling good. My experience is usually 100%. You know why? I never see it with the kids. It could be uh, mixed kids, mixed uh, variety of kids from different places, different, different color, different... I've never, never seen any problem with it. They all seem to be, and so that tells us a lot. They, we could learn from them. And there are so many people today, for the slightest reason, they still, I thought that was already forgotten, it was old hat. But people are still that way, and that's not nice, especially in the United States. I think we could do better. So that's my last word. Thank I think you. we should all try to be better.